Hello and welcome to Through the Bible in 10 Years. And today we're in Acts chapter 9. So in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is stoned and the church, at least the Greek-speaking church, is scattered. And there's a young man named Saul who agrees with stoning of Stephen and he holds the garments of those who stone Stephen. Um, this, of course, would have made a huge impression on a young man. And um, we, of course, uh, Luke wants us to see a continuity between that event and what's about to happen here in Acts chapter 9. We had a brief intermission in Acts chapter 8, uh, where we heard of Philip's uh, evangelizing, proclaiming of the good news uh, in Judea and Samaria. Now we get to um, chapter 9, and we're going to pick up the story with this young man, Saul. Saul, as we know from later on in the book of Acts, was a Roman citizen. Paul himself in none of his letters tells us this, but um, probably uh, Paul was, was part of his Roman name in some way. Um, in fact, the book of Acts starts calling Paul, Paul, after Paul has a encounter with a Roman governor named Sergius Paulus. Um, I wonder if there's a reason why Acts uh, begins to call him Paul at the point where um, Paul encounters Sergius Paulus. So, uh, okay, where am I here? We want to begin, I'm having a little, we, we have these technical difficulties. There we go. Okay, um, sorry for that. So um, he, he comes to Christ. He believes in Christ here in Acts chapter 9. This is one of the, there are several different presentations of Paul's. We call it his conversion, although he's not changing religions, right? He never stops being uh, an, a Hebrew. He never stops being an Israelite. Um, whether he, you know, he, he distances himself, he distances himself a little bit from the title Jew, uh, not as an ethnic marker, because he remains an ethnic Jew his whole life, um, but as a religious, uh, and again, he doesn't see himself as leaving the religion of Israel. This is important because we're so used to Judaism being a different religion uh, that it's very easy for us to overlay our modern construct on this and say, well, Paul stopped being a Jew and be began becoming a Christian. But these were not different things for Paul. For Paul, following Jesus was what every uh, Israelite should do. Uh, following Jesus was the quintessential expression of Israelite faith. And so um, Paul did not see a contradiction between his faith um, as a Jew and his faith as a Christian. Christian is really not a separate religion. It is an expression of, of, of what Paul would, would have thought of as true Israelite faith. Well, okay, let's dive in with verse number one. Um, I'm using interlinearbible.org here today. Um, thank you to the people who put this together. Of course, I'm not using their translations or anything. I'm doing the Greek text, of course, is common property. But anyway, but Paul still uh, breathing out uh, threats and murder. Um, so he's, uh, we don't, again, have any evidence of Paul killing anybody in the book of Acts. No, no evidence of that. He, breathing out. In other words, I'm going to get you. <laughs> I'm coming to get you. Um, toward the disciples of the Lord. Um, having gone to the high priest, um, he asked from him letters, epistles, uh, to Damascus to go to the synagogues in order that if he should find certain ones of the way, um, both uh, certain, I'm sorry, I don't think this comma should be here. Um, he should find uh, certain ones being of the way, both men and women, having bound, having been bound, uh, he might um, lead them to Jerusalem. Now, Damascus is a long way away from Jerusalem, and I think it's important for us to realize that Damascus is not within the political jurisdiction of the high priest. The high priest uh, presides over the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, and really, frankly, Judea is the jurisdiction of the Sanhedrin. Um, now, as far as Israelite faith is concerned, as far as Jewish faith is concerned, we might say that um, the high priest 
had jurisdiction over all of, of Judaism in a religious sense, uh, but not in a political sense, not in a arrest, I arrest you sense. Um, so this is a kind of a, seems like a little backdoor deal, kind of like uh, um, sending uh, uh, someone to a country, but they're not officially representing you. They're just kind of representing you under the table, um, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Uh, and so the high priest is sending uh, Saul, Paul, Saul, his Hebrew nickname, probably, Paul, his uh, technical Roman name. Um, and so the high priest, hey, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. I know some people up in Damascus. They don't like these Christians. See if you can arrest them for something. What would they be arresting them for? Well, this is a good question because they're uh, probably, probably um, insurrection or treason, something like that, something um, creating chaos in the empire. Romans did not like chaos. Um, but um, in, in any case, whether it, this is a legal deal or a backdoor deal, um, uh, they are sending Paul. Paul. Paul seems to have requested it. He's a he's a he's an up and comer, right? He's climbing up the ladder. He's trying to impress the leaders. He's trying to impress the boss. You know, we don't. It, it seems like it's Paul that initiates this, not the high priest. Hey, I'm going to go get some people for you. Maybe they were people known in quantities. Maybe, maybe these were people that the high priest had been trying to get their hands on and just couldn't quite find a way to do it. Uh, a lot of intrigue, perhaps, possibly here. By the way, in verse uh, 2, uh, Christianity is called the way. It's the first place in Acts where the Christian movement is called the way. So this must have been how they referred to them. Now, um, this, this word, the way, um, it seems to me that there is a connection between calling Christianity the way and John the Baptist message, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, and maybe even in John uh, chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Clearly, the followers of the way believe that Jesus was the way. And th there seems to be a connection here with John the Baptist. Um, and so it's a, um, it's a reform movement uh, within Judaism that started with John the Baptist and um, uh, aimed to um, clean up house, aimed to clean up the religion of, of and of course, I should say here that religion was not a distinct domain of life. We tend to part, in the Western world, we tend to partition up life into this is religious, this is not religious, this is natural, this is supernatural, this is um, this belongs to the political and this belongs to the religious and so forth. They did not divide up uh, their world into these domains the way that we, uh, we do. Um, and so I'm using our categories when I talk about um, uh, religious and so forth. But uh, they're followers of the way. They're individuals who believe that God is about to erupt into history and change things. God is about to erupt into history and fix things. God is about to kick the corrupt leaders out of Jerusalem and restore his temple to what it should be um, and um, perhaps overthrow the Romans in the process. So the way, uh, a very, I, I suspect, although we, we don't have a lot of evidence, frankly, we have these little hints here and there, but I suspect that this is a... Um, First of all, not a, tier, not a term of endearment uh, to the Jewish leaders, but the, one of the earliest ways of referring to uh, the Jesus movement, so to speak, and the John the Baptist movement, of which it was a part, uh, probably at first. Verse 3, and while he was proceeding, it came to pass that as he was drawing near to by, Damascus, is, is about as far north of the Sea of Galilee as Jerusalem is south. Of the Sea of Galilee. So if it's a three-day walking journey from Jerusalem to uh, Capernaum, it's another perhaps three-day three, three journey from Capernaum up to, to uh, Damascus. So Paul is way out of jurisdiction. He's way, he's left the building. He's out of Israel for sure. Damascus, of course, features in modern politics around the conflict in Syria uh, right now. Okay, um, continuing on with verse three, and immediately a light flashed around from the sky, verse 4, and having fallen on the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
I sure wish that God would uh, tap me on the shoulder like this if I get off base with my um, podcasts and videos and such. It'd be nice if we, you know, if the Lord, I don't think this light behind me, if you're watching the video version of this, uh, is the Lord, probably. Um, maybe it is. The Lord is on my right hand. No, never mind. <laughs> but um, I wish the Lord would tap me on the shoulder occasionally uh, and say, Ken, you're, you're just way off here. Um, God shows a great mercy to Paul, doesn't he? Isn't that something? Uh, Paul must have been, tr he had a zeal without knowledge, I think, which is what he says about his brothers and sisters in Israel who don't believe in Romans 10. Uh, he says, I say this, they have, a, they have a, a zeal, but it's a zeal without knowledge. And I think Paul must have saw himself uh, in that comment, surely, because here he is, he's persecuting the church. And Jesus taps him on the shoulder and says, hey, you're on the wrong team, man. <laughs> but Paul, he, he, he's a quick learner here, verse 5. And he said, who are you, Lord? Little double entendre here, because Lord means mister. Who are you, mister? But it also means Lord. And Jesus, you know, yes, I am the Lord. Um, uh, Paul's basically saying, who are you, sir? Or maybe he meant Lord, but it is a little bit of a double entendre. And Jesus said, uh, and, he, and he said, I am Jesus. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Apparently, we have some textual issues here. Uh, these are parts of the, te uh, the, the King James text that probably weren't in the original uh, manuscripts of Acts. Acts is an interesting, has an interesting history in terms of manuscripts. Um, this is particularly in what's called the Western tradition of manuscripts. Uh, there's this one manuscript of one manuscript of Acts, Codex Biza, from about the 500s, I think. Codex D. Uh, it's about a third, again, longer, if I remember correctly, than what we think the original manuscript. Somebody, somebody did a message version of Acts uh, in the manuscripts, added little details like how many steps Peter came down when he in in chapter 12 when he's arrested and escaped you know, kind of, they're not theological facts. They're like, yes, this was on the corner of 5th and, and 6th Avenue. Anyway, but um, some manuscripts have, it is hard for you to kick against the, uh, the goads. Um, and he, uh, trembling and troubled, said, Lord, uh, what do you want me to do? So these words are in what's called the Textus Receptus, the standardized Greek printed, printed text that evolved in, in the 1500s and early 1600s um, that became the basis of the King James Version that suggests that these words are probably in most medieval manuscripts, but uh, textual critics would by and large say that they probably weren't in the, the, early, uh, in the first manuscript of Acts. And, and I, I suggest, I don't have my materials here. You might see that I'm, I'm broadcasting probably from the last, for the last time from my old home in, in Marion um, which we sold yesterday, but um, uh, for good. Um, uh, I, anyway, never mind. Won't get off on a tangent. But um, uh, I don't have my materials available to look up exactly which manuscripts add this. Uh, but uh, I suspect that they are that the earliest manuscripts, like Codex Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, probably don't have uh, these words in them. If uh, if um, um, I were to guess, so. But nothing wrong with the words, of course. Um, just not likely to have been in the original manuscript of Acts. Well, let's continue with verse 6. But rise up and enter into the city, um, and it will be told to you uh, what, whatever you, it is necessary for you to do. Um, and Paul does it. And the men, the one traveling with him, they stood uh, speechless. Uh, on the one hand, uh, hearing the sound, but beholding no one. Now, uh, when Paul tells this story later on, he says uh, they um, see a light, but they don't um, hear the voice. So there's a little bit of a, how do we fit all these together? Um, it, was, it was allowed for there to be some variations among um, accounts in the ancient world. There's nothing uh, contradictory about, about that. Can they be harmonized? Maybe. I mean, there have been suggestions made. Um, you know, you'd think that since this is Luke's, this is it within one document, you would think that, that, that uh, it would be harm, harmonious within 
the book itself. Um, but um, I don't worry about uh, these sorts of little details. When, when we say the Bible's without error, um, we, we mean, I mean, within what was considered an error at the time. And uh, history writing back then was not the same, did not have the same standards as history writing today. So I'm not troubled by these little um, kind of tensions in uh, things like that. But here in Acts 9, it says that they hear a sound, um, but they, they don't see anyone. Okay, which of course they don't see anybody in the later account either. They see a light. Verse 8. But Saul uh, rose up from the ground, and um, his eyes having been opened, um, he could see, he was seeing nothing. So he, he, he closed his eyes when it happened. Then he opens his eyes, and um, he's, he's somewhat blinded. So he has a kind of event, an event happens here. Um, and um, leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, verse 9. And he was three days without seeing and he neither ate nor drink. So um, some people have wondered if this is the, um, the experience he mentions in 2 Corinthians, uh, where he says he was taken up into the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. Um, the timing doesn't work out exactly right. Uh, he says it was 14 years ago, uh, before for, uh, bef 14 years before Second wrote this part of 2 Corinthians. When that event happened, well, that would have, 14 years before that event happened would have been in the early 40s, um, and this event is probably around 33, about three years after uh, Jesus rose from the dead. But again, numbers are not exact necessarily. 14 is a somewhat symbolic number because it's seven times two, and seven is a perfect number. So um, I don't necessarily expect the numbers to be exact, but if we take the numbers as they appear, then that event he mentions in Second Corinthians would have taken place about 10 years after uh, this particular event. Um, so verse 10. So that's the, that's the Paul side of, of the story so far. Now let's hear the Ananias Safari. Uh, not Ananias and Sapphira, <laughs> they're dead. How about the Ananias, the, the good, devout Christian in Damascus side of the story? Verse 10. And there was a certain disciple in Damascus by, by the name of Ananias. And um, the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. Um, and Ananias said, Behold, here am I, Lord. Uh, verse 11. And the Lord said to him, Go into the street which is called Straight, Straight Street, um, and seek in the house of Judas, uh, Saul by name, of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, verse 12. And um, he saw a man, here's again, this may not be in the original manuscript, in a vision. Um, he saw a, na a man in a vision, Ananias by name, having come and having put hands on him so that he might see again. Okay, so God is, has, has anointed uh, or has ordained that Ananias would uh, come and help Paul with his sight. Verse 13, and Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many. God, I, I've heard of this guy <laughs> concerning this man. Uh, as many bad things he did to the saints, to your saints, to your holy ones in Jerusalem. Verse 14, and here he has authority from the high priests, from the chief priests, uh, to bind all the ones who are called uh, by the name of you, including me. So you're sending me, this is kind of an Esther moment, isn't it? Um, verse 15, and the Lord said to him, go, uh, for he is a, cho a chosen vessel, a vessel of choice. He is for me, this man, to carry my name before the Gentiles, uh, both Gentile, or, sorry, again, I don't know what's going on with the comma here, both uh, Gentiles and kings. Uh, and the sons of Israel. So, of course, Paul will appear before Nero, according to tradition, or at least he'll appear in Rome. And he appeared certainly before governors, and so forth, before Agrippa, uh, Herod Agrippa II, later on in Acts. For I will, I will show to him as many things that it is necessary for him uh, concerning my name to suffer. So don't worry, 
He's caused some people to suffer. He'll get his. <laughs> he's going to suffer too. Um, he, he's going to get back at, at more than as much as he's, he's uh, dished out. Verse 17. And Ananias went away and entered into the house. So Ananias is a, a faithful believer who does what the Lord tells him to do. Which, of course, needs to be the case for all of us as well. And having laid upon him hands, he said, Saul, brother, the Lord has sent me. Jesus, the Lord Jesus has sent me. Which Lord here? The Lord Jesus, the one who appeared to you in the way in which you are coming, so that you may see uh, and might be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, again, I have argued throughout our trek in Acts that receiving the Holy Spirit is the threshold event for the people of God. And Paul's about to become part of the, the true people of God who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, and immediately fell on him from his, the, the scales, as scales, um, immediately they fell from his eyes. And he, he regained his sight. He looked up and having risen, he was baptized. Now here's an example of somebody who seems to receive the Holy Spirit before they are baptized. Happens in different orders. We're going to do chapter 10, Lord willing, next week. And then the Gentiles will receive the Holy Spirit before their baptism. So baptism um, is not exactly sacramental in the book of Acts. Of course, I believe baptism is a sacrament of incorporation into the body of Christ, a sacrament of cleansing. Um, but uh, in the book of Acts, the cleansing doesn't usually, it usually doesn't happen exactly uh, with baptism. A baptism is a sign, uh, an outward sign of an inward and um, uh, an, an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Um, but I do believe that God changes us in baptism. Uh, so uh, I do believe that baptism is sacramental. I'm simply pointing out that um, it is not, it does not coincide exactly with the work of grace. Uh, it is, it correlates with receiving the Holy Spirit, which is the, which is the, uh, the most important uh, part of the, um, of the process. Well, okay, I might get a little hot water with what I just said. So feel free to discuss. Uh, verse 19, and having taken food, because remember he's been fasting, fasting he was strengthened. Um, and he was uh, with the ones in Damascus, with the disciples in Damascus, uh, a number of days. Well, we know from the book of Galatians that he remains in the area of Damascus for about three years. We certainly don't get that, uh, that impression that it's that long here. Um, but uh, he will remain around. It'll be about three years uh, before he goes down to Jerusalem, according to his own account uh, in the book of Galatians. Well, Paul is now uh, not only a believer, but he is a baptized believer, and he has received the Holy Spirit. By the way, nothing said here about tongues, uh, just as there was nothing said in Acts 8 about tongues in Samaria. Tongues is not mentioned as a norm of receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, the Gentiles will speak in tongues in, in Acts 10, uh, but I believe the reason there is to demonstrate that, that uh, the inclusion of the Gentiles is in no way inferior to the inclusion of the Jews in Acts 2, um, that the same things that happened to the Jews in Acts 2 happened to the Gentiles in Acts 10, showing that they are, in fact, full participants in the body of Christ. Well, verse 20. So, and immediately in the synagogues, Paul was preaching Jesus. By the way, um, there is some reason to think that even though Paul regained his sight, he continued to have eye troubles for the rest of his life. He mentions in 1 Corinthians 12 that the Galatians would have given them his own eyes if they could have, which to me suggests that he continues to have eye, eye trouble. And this seem, seems to correlate with the, with the, the uh, thorn in the flesh in, in 2 Corinthians 12, I think. Most have thought that uh, in the years. Many, some don't. Some want to distance it from a physical, especially those who believe that if you have enough faith, you'll be healed of anything, which is a false uh, interpretation of Scripture. Um, uh, God does heal, but He doesn't heal everyone. Um, but uh, Paul. So Paul. I think there's good reason to think that Paul does recover, but he doesn't completely recover um, from from his eye troubles. Okay. So Paul's now preaching Jesus is the Son of God. This must be very annoying. <laughs> and of course, he doesn't go back to Jerusalem for some time. Verse 21, and all the ones who heard were amazed 
And they were saying, is this not the one who has destroyed uh, in, in Jerusalem those calling on the name of the Lord? And here, um, he, has come, he had come here for this reason, having been bound that he might lead them into the high priests. What's going on here? I thought this guy was coming to arrest people who said what he's saying. Verse 22, but Saul uh, was empowered even more and he was uh, confounding the Jews um, who dwelled in Damascus, proving that the Christ, this is the Christ, that Jesus is the anointed one. Jesus is the Messiah. And as sufficient days were fulfilled, about three years, uh, the Jews plotted together to kill him. By the way, in 2 Corinthians, Paul doesn't mention Jews. Um, now, they may, have, they may have cooperated, but um, in Paul's own words, those who try to kill him at the end are, or actually doesn't say kill him, but those who try to arrest him in the end are um, uh, the, the ethnarch, the, that is the, the leader of the ethnic group, the Arab ethnic group in uh, Damascus. Apparently, the, um, the Arab ethnic group in Damascus had a, a representative or a kind of a, a leader that they elected. Uh, or I don't know how what the process was of choosing the leader, but there was a leader of the Arabs in uh, Damas Damascus. Uh, Damascus is right at the end of the Roman Empire. So if you go east of Damascus just a little bit, um, you go into what's called the Nabataean Kingdom. And the Nabataean Kingdom is an Arab kingdom, not Saudi Arabia, uh, but Arab ethnic ethnicity. And... Um, this, uh, Paul says that he went into Arabia in Galatia during this three-year period. Now, I don't think that means he went to Saudi Arabia. I suspect what it means is, is that he went east of um, Damascus across the Roman Empire border into Arabia. And um, we don't know why. Uh, for example, is it possible that at what uh, at an earlier point he had to flee Damascus because he'd caused a lot of controversy there in the synagogues uh, because Paul's a controversial figure he's a, he's a big mouth <laughs> he says he says things <laughs> and um, it's going to get him into trouble more than once I suspect and um, Paul seems to he becomes more mature as time this is often the case you you sometimes have young zealous preachers who cause a lot of controversy. God uses them, you know, whether they have to be that boisterous or not. I, I doubt they do. It's a, it's a personality thing, but God uses boisterous people. Um, and, uh, but they tend to mature, you know, the, the young whippersnappers that are fiery firebrands that get everybody upset uh, as they get older and their metabolism slows down, uh, they tend to get more mature. And, and I think we see that a little bit in Paul's writings. Philippians is much calmer in Galatians, although I don't think there's a lot of years, frankly, between the two. In fact, could be contemporaneous uh, by some accounts cl or close contemporaries. Um, anyway, that's not important right now. We'll get there. But um, uh, I can I can see Paul being a firebrand uh, in Damascus and um, and having to kind of flee Damascus to Nabatea, uh, and. Um, so we don't know exactly, but he, he must have ticked somebody off in Arabia too, or in the Nabataean kingdom too, because we find him in 2 Corinthians having to be lowered down the wall in a basket, basket because the Arab ethnarch is waiting to arrest him at the front gate of Damascus. Um, and so, but, but what I want to point out is that, that the book of Acts gives us the impression, and this is consistent in the book of Acts, Book of Acts gives us the impression that it's it's the non-believing Jews who are always out to get him. But in Paul's own words, that's not the whole picture. In fact, in his estimation, it is not the Jews who are after him uh, in Damascus primarily. They're, they may have been also after him, but that the ones who are primarily after him were um, Nabataeans. Uh, okay, well, let's keep going here. Um, the Jews uh, tried to kill him. They were counseling to kill him. And it became known to this, this plot, their plot became known to Saul. Um, and they were closely watching also uh, the gates both day and night uh, with the result that they might kill him. And having the disciples having taken him at night. So uh, again, we get, there have been some who've become, have taken away a kind of anti-Semitic uh, takeaway from 
the book of Acts. Um, and we have to remember that um, at, Luke is writing this for a, probably for a Roman audience, Theophilus, right? A, a Roman official, maybe even, maybe for Gentiles. And so Luke seems to emphasize non-believing Jewish opposition. Of course, again, Paul's a Jew, so it's not just Jewish. It's not ethnic opposition. It's because Paul is a Jew. Most Christians at this time, oh, well, almost all Christians are Jews at this particular point in time, uh, because it hasn't really gone to the Gentiles yet. Um, but um, Luke emphasizes Jewish, non-believing Jewish opposition to Paul. Um, from Paul's own letters, we get a, a more nuanced um, uh, understanding of, of opposition to him. So the disciples having taken him by night through the wall, they, they led him down and lowered him in a basket. So the basket is the same in 2 Corinthians and here in Acts, but in Paul's own words, it's not the Jews who are after him, but the Arab Arabs from uh, Arab ethnar. Okay, verse 26. And having arrived in Jerusalem, he was trying to join with the disciples. And they, they were all fearing him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas, here's this Barnabas. Remember Barnabas? Uh, we've seen him already. Barnabas, the son of encouragement. This is the guy that sold some property and gave it to those who had need. Here we see him again being a reconciler uh, between Paul and the disciples. Of course, Barnabas is a Hellenistic Jew. He's a Greek-speaking Jew. So that makes sense. I'm sure he spoke Aramaic too. But Barnabas, having, and he's from Cyprus originally, the island of Cyprus. Barnabas, uh, having taken Paul, he led him to the disciples. Uh, Peter, come out from behind the curtain. Paul's not going to hurt you. <laughs> I love this. Um, and uh, uh, Barnabas related to them. Oh, no, Paul. And Paul related to them how on the road he saw the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly. He had been bold in the name of Jesus. Um, and uh, he was with them coming in and going out in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Uh, now, what's interesting is, is that um, in, in Paul's own writings, uh, Paul emphasizes the, privacy, the private nature of this visit to Jerusalem. We have a different impression from Acts. The impression we get from Acts is that Paul's very publicly um, speaking here, verse 29, and he was speaking and he was debating with the, the Hellenists, with the Greek-speaking Jews, and they were trying to kill him. Um, uh, and having known, the brothers having known this, they brought him down to Caesarea on the coast, and they sent him away to Tarsus. Now, this is, again, there's a different impression we get here from what Paul says in Galatians. Paul says he, he was there for two weeks, uh, that he only met Peter and James and, and uh not, he did not meet many Jewish brothers uh, while he was there. Of course, um, uh, the impression we do have here is that he's with more Hellenistic audiences rather than the Aramaic-speaking audiences. So you can fit it together that way. Uh, but but uh, we definitely get the impression from Galatians that Paul's visit was a little bit on the down low, which makes sense, right? Uh, because um, I'm sure the high priest still wants uh, to get a hold of him uh, because uh, you mess things up really bad, Paul. You made me look really bad, Saul. Um, and so uh, it, it makes perfect sense that Paul would have been a little bit sly on this visit. And again, in Galatians, it's, it's three years later uh, that he does this, this trip. Okay, verse 31. Therefore, then, the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria was having peace, having been built up and having uh, going on in the fear of the Lord. So they don't fear, they're not fearing so much opposition from the city anymore, but opposition, uh, but, but they are in the fear of the Lord, that is, the healthy respect of knowing that God is God. Um, and they were in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and they were multiplied in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So the church enjoys a little bit of, of peace. Probably Paul comes down to Jerusalem around 36. Uh, we know that there was a little bit turmoil in Damascus in 36, actually for a brief time, uh, the Arab Nabataeans took over uh, Damascus from, uh, then it would have been Herod, Herod uh, Antipas, the one who put John the Baptist to death, um, was in deep dookie with the Nabataeans because he divorced his first wife, who had been the son of the Nabataean king, King Eretus the fourth, I believe. Um, and so uh, the Nabataeans overrun Damascus and um, uh, 
uh, actually control Damascus in 36. Uh, and it's about that time that Paul uh, leaves Damascus and comes down to Jerusalem. The Romans drive them back, by the way. Um, say, go back home. Uh, okay, verse 32. And it came to pass that Peter, so now we're going to have a little bit more Judea and Samaria. Put, put Paul on hold. We'll come back to Paul uh, when we get to, uh, a little bit later in chapter 12. Uh, but for now, Paul is going to be back in Damascus, in uh, Tarsus. What's he doing there? I assume he's evangelizing. Uh, and for the next uh, eight years, I think, seven or eight years, Paul will be back in that region, probably uh, evangelizing. Hold that thought till we get back to Acts 11, uh, when we will see Paul again. So it came to pass that Peter, who was going through everywhere, uh, he went down to the saints who were dwelling at Lydda. This is on the coast. And he found there a certain man by the name of Aeneas uh, for eight years sitting on a bed. So he's been lame for seven years, uh, who was paralyzed. He's a paralytic, uh, I should say, rather than lame. Verse uh, 34. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, uh, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise up um, and make the bed, make your own, pick up your bed. And immediately he rose up and everyone dwelling in Lydda saw him and in Sharon, um, who turn uh, to the Lord. Interesting that Peter doesn't let the guy get to choose whether he gets up. I suppose this is uh, normal uh, that if, you know, he would, of course you would want to be healed. Um, there are places, of course, where Jesus says, do you want to be healed? Um, and so forth. Um, so this man is, is healed. And it's a reminder that the things that Jesus did, Peter does. We're going to see later on in Acts, Paul does. And the implication, I think, is, is that we can, as well, by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, do these signs and wonders as well today as well. Uh, verse 36. So this is healing number one, a man named Aeneas. The name Aeneas, of course, Aeneas is the name of the hero of Roman history. Uh, Aeneas was a Trojan, uh, son of the Trojan king, who when the Greeks beat the Trojans, Aeneas made, him, made his way to Rome, according to the tradition. Verse 36, uh, and in Joppa, there was a certain disciple by the name of Tabitha, uh, which being tra translated is called Dorcas. Um, so Dorcas is the uh, Greek name um, because Luke is writing for a Greek speaking audience. And this one was full of good works, which is not a bad thing. Good works aren't bad. They don't save you, but they're, they're not bad. And uh, uh, of alms, she was full of, of uh mercy doings of alms, which she was doing. Verse 37, and it came to pass in those days that having become sick, um, she died. And having washed her, they put her in an upper room, upper room theme, verse 38. And being near to Joppa, uh, Lydda being near to Joppa, the disciples having heard that Peter was uh, in uh, Joppa, two men sent to him calling, um, do not delay to come to us, verse 39. And Peter, having risen up, came to them, and who, having arrived, uh, uh, they brought him into the upper room, and everyone stood by, all the widows stood by, weeping and showing the um, outer garments, the inner garments, the shirts, the shirts and the coats, the inner garments and the outer garments that she was making uh, with them all, when she was with them all, Dorcas. Um, she must not be dead too long because, of course, uh, bodies that uh, in, in cultures where they don't embalm, uh, and they didn't embalm yet at this point here, um, they, de they decay quickly. Um, and so she must not be uh, too long dead here. Verse 40, and having put them outside, all of them, uh, Peter having done and having bowed his knees, he prayed. And having turned to the body, he said, Tabitha, rise. Um, and she opened her eyes, and having seen Peter, she sat up. So again, what Jesus does, Peter does, and we will see that Paul does. And therefore, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do. 41, and having given to her uh, his hand, he raised her up, and having called the saints and the widows, he presented her living. And it became known through all of Joppa, and many believed in the Lord, verse 43. And it came to pass uh, that certain days um, he remained in Joppa 
with a certain Simon, a tanner. This is interesting that he's a tanner because what do tanners do? They skin things. And so uh, he's, by the, he's by the sea, of course, and um, uh, because it's very smelly business um, and a very unclean business. These people are not considered to be, I mean, he deals with dead things all the time, right? So this person is not considered to be particularly high on the socioeconomic scale. That is, he's, he's not, um, he's not, this is not a, a prized profession. He's a bit, un, he's just a teeny bit unclean. Um, and so again, it's another testament to the fact uh, that the gospel is for everyone, that the gospel is not just for men. Uh, the gospel is not just for Jews. The gospel is not just for people of high repute. Uh, the gospel is not just for the clean. Uh, the gospel is not just for the whole. Um, the gospel is for everyone. Well, this has been through the Bible uh, in 10 years, Acts chapter 9, the coming of Paul to Christ, the calling of Paul, where Paul believes on Jesus.